All right, we're recording, so let me share and just go of what what is the tidyverse and uh, how do I use it? Um, so the tidyverse is a collection of packages for R that all play nicely together. They're sort of all designed to work together in a particular way to make it easier to work with really messy data. So this is my like favorite little picture of of what the tidyverse it's, its sort of role in the R community because like R is a really powerful language. You can do everything the tidyverse you can do. You can do with sort of base R, but it's it's really like bringing a tank to the battle where um, a lot of the tedious things that you have to do in base R can be really streamlined with. Uh, these little octagons here are all like the individual packages. And so that's the image. So if you just Google tidyverse, you'll see our tidyverse.org. This is what that's referring to. All of these individual packages do certain things, but they're designed to have a similar interface. And uh, so one is really good for like dplyr is good for manipulating the data frame and like reshaping it, creating new variables, doing a lot of just messing around with with the data set ggplot is like the main tool for taking that data frame and visualizing it making plots out of it um string r is uh, a library that's just for manipulating strings and so in my course i teach like a lot of these individual pieces read r is for reading in data reading and writing data from external files like csv files into r and there's a few others but my course kind of covers a lot of these. And so I, these are different lesson slides from different lessons from this year that I just want to show you kind of like what a few of these do. And there's more, right? Obviously there's a lot more packages that we're not talking about, but that's the idea. Um, so first of all, um, this is the other visual that you often see when you, when you hear people talking about the role that Tidyverse is playing in the broader sort of data science exercise or task that like this is a general full cycle program where you get some data from someone you tidy it up you have to do some manipulation to it you transform it you reshape it you create new variables you do what you need to do with it you visualize it you do some exploratory work from those visuals that help you inform maybe how i'm going to model something i create a model and this is a highly iterative process until i get a result where I think I've learned something from the model and then I have to communicate that. So you're usually going back to visualizing again and you're doing really polished charts to present the idea. So all of these tasks are, you know, part of a process from going from raw data to insight. And each of these packages, you know, do different parts along that cycle. But th this particular class, which was from this week, was about the wrangling part. And that's kind of what the dplyr library is for. So that's this little one. It's like pliers. Um, because you're, you're gonna be just taking all this messy data and manipulating it in a way. Um, so let me show you a little like a few of the functions that do you draw the cartoons? This. I do not draw these. See, these are Horst, oh, okay. Allison Horst, who I should have had on that slide, but I think I have her linked on some other slides. So Allison Horst, um, is the artist here who does all these lovely little charts, their stat il illustrations, and she has like tons of them here. And um, about a lot of them are are really just for R. Like she's like a big R person, and uh, uh, there's just loads it's of these great. little like they all have these little monsters in here. That's like her characters that she's created, and and they're just really great, uh, really great little art illustrations of. Um, of like what certain packages do and um, uh, anyway, so I, I just, I always put them in my slides and. <laughs> yeah, um, she's good. Do, she's really great. Cute. Yeah. And I think she was actually officially the artist in resident at our studio last year. I think they actually created an official position for her. And so she's been doing more and more since, but you should follow her on Twitter. She has lots of great, um, great graphics. So um, there's a bunch of different, uh, functions inside all of these libraries there and and this is actually one of the things that a lot of people complain about about the whole tidyverse is that if you start learning things this way then you have to learn all these different functions and 
if you just stick with base R, there's a few sort of basic strategies for doing a lot of different things. The counter argument to that is that while yes, you have to learn how to use different words, that these words are extremely intuitive. Like it's extremely clear what they're doing and they read the way things are written. They read from left to right, just like you're reading in English. So it, uh, when you look at a block of code that has maybe multiple operations sequenced together, it becomes a lot more intuitive to, you could show this to anyone who's never coded at all and say, what do you think this code block is doing? And most people can read through it and go, it looks like they're, you know, selecting some columns and filtering out some rows and creating some new variables. And whereas if you did that with just base R, it's, it, unless you're quite involved and have been using R for a while, it gets harder to know what's exactly going on. So, so I find it to be actually, I think that the entry point for, for beginners, I, I think I actually think it's easier to learn the tidyverse things first um, because I find them more intuitive and there's heated debates on all these things, but, but regardless, in, in my experience in teaching this stuff, um, I find students are able to pick this up very fast and, and much faster than a lot of the base R uh, functions. So, so I teach it because I think it's a really powerful tool. So my example that I used in my course was the Spice Girls. Um, so here's just a very simple data frame of the five Spice Girls and some information about them. You know, so this is what a data frame kind of looks like. You've got rows and columns and each row is an observation. So here's Melanie Brown. She was Scary Spice, born in 1975. I have this deceased call because I have another data frame about the Beatles. And so some of the Beatles are now no longer living. Um, so I do the, the different boy band and girl band from, from the British bands. Um, so I'll preview these very quickly. In, in my course, we take some time aside to practice using them, but I'm just gonna show you what some of these variables do. So selecting is pretty straightforward. We're, we have a bunch of columns and we're just selecting columns by name. So I want the Spice Girls, I just want the first and last name columns. This is what you would have to do in base R. You have to put some brackets around the data frame and create a vector. And so there's a lot of other stuff you gotta, gotta do. And dplyr, it's pretty straightforward. You just say, select, give me the data frame and give me the, the names that I want. Um, no quotes, uh, no brackets none of these extra pieces that you need. Um, just select, select the data frame, give me the columns I want. And it has some extra features, uh, like you can get creative with how you wanna select. So I can say, I wanna select a column, all of the columns that end with a particular word. So here I say ends with name, and I get the first name and last name, because both of those columns have the name, name at the end. And this gets really handy when you've got a really big data frame with like lots and lots of columns, then you can, you know, select a group of them with just a single statement. Filter is doing the opposite. So instead of selecting columns, filter is filtering out rows. So I want to keep, like, let's say I want to get the band members born after 1974. So I want these two, right? Because they're born after 1974. So how would I do that? Well, base R, this gets even more messy. I've got to create a vector of which Spice Girls were born after 1974, put that inside his brackets and slice it. Um, and if you're familiar with R, this is really straightforward, but if you've never seen R, why do I have Spice Girls twice? Like there's a bunch of questions that starts coming up of like, what's really going on here? And don't forget this little comma, things like that. Whereas here in dplyr, it's the same exact sort of structure as select. Whereas select, I say select from this data frame, give me the columns. Here I'm saying filter from this data frame and here's the condition that I'm filtering by. So again, no brackets, no commas, no extra syntax, just very straightforward data frame and the condition I'm looking for. So I've, I've selected out those two rows. I filtered out those two rows. Uh, here's just another example. Let's filter out all the band members with the name Melanie. So first name is equal to Melanie. There you go, you get these two rows. So, so very straightforward. Here's some practicing. Um, where it really gets powerful though, I, and what I think is the probably the my favorite feature of this whole tidyverse thing. So that, that was just two things we can do, filtering and selecting. There's many more, but the, the, the thing that I like the most is this pipe operation where you can sequence a bunch of operations together. So, um, You've probably seen 
this image before, maybe, maybe not, the treachery of images. So this is this famous painting that says, this is not a pipe. Um, even though it's, it's a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe or it's a picture of a pipe, so it's not a pipe, right? That's the kind of concept behind, I guess, the, the contrast in this, in this painting. So the package label for this package that has the pipe feature in it is, steals that idea. It says, this is not a pipe because the percent caret percent is called the pipe operator. So it's kind of a joke. Um, so the pipe operator, I think of it as the words and then, really what it's doing, it's sequencing things from left to right. So if you weren't using a pipe, if you thought, think about like doing something in a sequence of, of orders, typically they're inside functions. And so functions are done from the inside out, right? You, you go to the basic argument and each of those becomes an argument to the next one, kind of like going out in layers. So this is not real code, but this is a story, right? I start with me and then I wake up. So I have to use wake up of me. And after I wake up, then I get out of bed. So I have to say, get up, get out of bed of wake up of me. And then I get dressed. So I have to say, get dressed of get out of bed of wake up of me. So you're reading the story in reverse and it's not very intuitive. And with pipes, it reads like this. You start with me and then I wake up and then I get out of bed and then I get dressed and then I leave the house. So this is the way we think uh, uh, like it sequentially much more like reading, you know, text of English. Um, so that's what's going on with a, with a pipe operator. You're able to take the thing before it and hand it to the, the function after it instead of doing this sort of layered thinking. So, so let's say I got my Spice Girls and I want to filter out the band members born after 1974. And then I only want to keep the columns first name and last name. So here's that layered onion approach, right? I would first filter out the Spice Girls and then I have to take that and hand it to select. And so even though this is only two operations, it already gets really messy and long. With pipes, I can start with the data frame itself, the Spice Girls, and then use this pipe to say, do this after, do this next. So start with Spice Girls and then filter out the years and then select the names. So to me, this is a lot easier to read than this. This, this is kind of, kind of messy. So the pipe operator is really doing a lot of, of legwork here to make code more easier to read to the, to the human uh, you know, coder. Um, and again, I think I could hand this to just about anybody. And I think you could understand what's going on, right? If I showed you what the Spice Girls data frame looked like, and then I showed you this block of code and said, what do you think is going to happen? I think people would probably be able to get down to this, that we're filtering out these people and we're just picking these two column names. Um, so that, that's like the idea of these, uh, these, these sort of tidyverse functions and how you can string them together with pipes. And so there's, there's loads and loads of other um, functions and I'll just show you like one more. Um, to, uh, so here's another arrange. Arrange just resorts the data frame based on some other variable like the year. I'll show you one more for creating new variables with mutate. So I got a data frame, I'm gonna create a new one, a new variable based on some of the other ones. So there's another nice picture from Allison Horst. Um, it's mutate, so it's the mutants, right? It's the X-Men, they're mutants and they're mutating the data frame. Very clever. Um, so, let's say I want to compute the age of the Spice Girls, right? I, I know their year of birth. And so I can take the current year, which this is outdated, this should have been 2020. Um, so whatever the current year is minus that year of birth and you'll get their age. So this is how you would do this with base R. Um, so uh, other new stuff you have to learn, you have to learn how to select variables with this dollar sign symbol. You have to create a pull off that vector of your birth and subtract it from a year. Um, and dplyr, you're, you're following the same pattern. It's, it's just like you're using filter and select. Well, you're going to use this thing called mutate. So I start with my data frame and then I pipe something that means and then do this and then mutate. And here's my new variable. Age is going to be equal to the year, the current year minus the year of birth. So 2019 minus this column gets me this column. So that's their year, their age. Um, 
And then another nice thing about this is that you can immediately use the variable you've created. So I created this age variable here, but then if I wanted to get like the mean age across all of them, I could take the mean of age, even though I, I, I didn't even finish computing it yet, but it's gonna do this in order so that I can use this right away. So I got both of these columns right away in that one you take call. call. So, so you can start seeing how you can do a lot of different things with uh, a data frame using a consistent framework. You start with the data frame, use your little pipe operator to then do sequences of operations, which usually involve creating new variables with mutate, filtering out conditions based on, you know, I'm looking for a subset of the data and selecting off columns that I might be looking for. Um, so that's all part of dplyr. So that's just this one package inside R, inside this bigger tidyverse. So I think dplyr is probably the workhorse of, of the tidyverse. It's probably doing 80% of what people use is all coming from that package. And these other things are really doing very specialized, uh, specialized work that work inside this framework. So I'm going to show you another one called string R. So that's this little violin one here for dealing with strings. And strings in R are really tricky. Um, they don't work like um, in other languages. Like in Python, you can do this. Um, actually, I can open up Python Watch, reticulate. Let's do it. Okay. You still have to do a reticulate session for us. Yeah, one day I'll show you how to use this. But I'm in Python now, not R. It looks like I'm in R because I'm in R Studio, but I'm actually in Python. So this is really nice in Python. You can say foo plus bar and you get foobar, right? That is really awesome. I love that you can do this in, in Python to merge strings together by just basically doing math, right? You're like doing math with strings. So you can also do this like three times foo and you get foo, foo, foo. I find that it's like so intuitive. Um, if I were to do this and you didn't know like what language we were talking about, but I just said, what do you think would happen? That would be my guess, right? I would get, they would merge them together. And you can't do this in, in, in R, like it just doesn't, it doesn't work. So now I'm back in R. If I do this in R, it's like, eh, we, we can't add, so this, is, this is a non-numeric argument. We can't add strings together. This isn't a thing. So in R, you have to use special functions to merge things. So the one in R is called paste. So you can paste foo with bar. So you're handing it two different arguments and you're saying, I want you to paste these things together and you get foo bar. Of course, there's a space in there because there's an additional argument called sep for how do you want to separate it? And the default is to separate it with a space. So I can get rid of that and say foo bar. So it's a lot more effort, I think. It, this, this is a, a dedicated function that does one thing, which is paste strings together. And there's other dedicated functions that do all sorts of things for, let's say if I want to search for is there a substring like, um, let's say I've got some string called apple and I want to know, is there a string like, is this inside apple? Uh, is this substring inside it? Well, in Python, you can do this. Super convenient, right? Is, is this thing in Apple? Yes, it is. <laughs> so you can, it's like literally just writing English. Like is, is PP in Apple? Yes. Can't do that in R. Um, so in R, again, you have to have a dedicated function for, for handling strings. So I've got my string Apple and I have to use this thing called G REPL, which is super not easy to remember what that means. G REPL, uh, I have to look for the pattern inside S and I get true. Um, so this is how every string, this is all base R. So we're not in the tidyverse, we're using base R stuff. This is how it works. You, you use a dedicated function for a very specific purpose, like looking for a substring. The issue with base R things with string is that these function names are terribly difficult to remember and they're inconsistent in the order that you give, give things, right? So this is saying you have to give me the pattern that you're looking for and then give me the string that you're looking for the pattern in. And that's not the same when you go to other string functions, they flip them, you give it the string first and then the pattern. And so I, I, it's just very confusing to keep them in order. So the string R library sort of harmonizes a lot of these things. All of the functions start with the word str for string. And all of them I find to be very intuitive of like what they're doing. So string sub, 
that gives me a substring, string locate. This tells me the index of where is that substring. String dupe duplicates a string. So if, if I wanted to do that like three times foo thing, I could say string dupe foo and replicate it three times. Oops, I don't have the library loaded. So I get foo foo foo. Um, so everything starts with stir. So if you've loaded this library, you just part like start with str underscore and then you have all these different string functions. So like string detect, I wanna say, here's the string I'm looking for and I'm looking for this pattern. That's, that's this tidyverse way of doing that. That's searching for that string. Um, and so the, the nice thing about the string R library is every function follows the same pattern where the first thing you give it is the string that you're sort of doing the work on. So in string dupe, I'm gonna take the first argument is here's the string that I'm working with, it's foo. And what am I gonna do with it? I'm gonna duplicate it three times. String detect, here is the string I'm working on. I'm looking at Apple. I'm looking for this pattern, the double P, and I get true. Um, so it's all kind of harmonized. And so while you have to, again, remember all these different names, I think it's much easier to remember what those names are doing as opposed to like, you know, which is easier, string detect versus G REPL. I think I could guess what this one's doing. I have no idea what this one's doing if, if, unless I'm like been using R for a while. So, so string R is doing, you know, filling this gap of, of allowing you to manipulate strings in a lot of different ways. These are just some of them. Um, there's more. Uh, so that's all of those. Here's some more like string trim where it cuts off white space. I have a bunch of white space. It just drops that white space off. Splitting a string, you break it up into its components. Um, what else have they got in here? Sorting strings, detecting strings we already saw, replacing strings. So notice that, I me mean, again, they're all consistently starting with the same pattern. And so this is kind of the, the nature of why the tidyverse was created, because it enables a consistency of function names so that they're easier to use and remember how to use them. And so by the end of like, you know, this one lesson, you're probably learned 20 new functions and, and people sometimes gripe about like, well, I got to, how am I supposed to remember 20 functions? And well, I mean, if you speak English as a native speaker, you probably know 20,000 words or more. I mean, we, we have a incredible ability to remember thousands of words. Uh, <laughs> and this is like how our minds work. So learning 20 functions is, uh, is not so hard, I think. It's very easy to remember those. Um, what's much harder is learning 20 functions that are completely inconsistent versus learning functions that all align in the same way. They all use the same argument order. They all start with the same prefix. So I, I think that's a, a much nicer way to think. So I, I pretty much exclusively work with the string R library when I use strings in R. I never even teach the base functions because I find them too confusing and um, I, I will tell you every, every time I try to use grepl, I have to Google it. Like, how does it actually work? Which, what's the order of the things? And I always get it wrong. So that's strings. We've done dplyr, we've done string r, haven't done reader yet. So let's look at readr. Um, readr is for reading in files. And so how, how I tell people, uh, to, uh, how I teach ways to read in files is, um, first use this other package called here, which isn't actually part of the tidyverse, but it might as well, I think, be because everyone I know who's a, who's like a really tidyverse enthusiast, they use here. Um, uh, here just creates a path on your computer for where your data lives. So let's say I've got my file open and inside here, I see some folder called data and there's this wildlife impacts CSV. This is a data file about birds hitting planes. Um, it's a very weird data set. So how would I get to that? Like, how would I know where that is? Well, that's where this here library comes into play. If I load it, and then I just say here, where am I? This is where I am. I'm here. Um, this is the same thing as asking, where is my working directory? Where is R currently looking? When I open up R Studio, it's looking somewhere, and it's looking at this particular file path. So on my computer, you know, here's my file path. I'm in this folder. And you see the same things here, the same files here. And if I want to go into a subfile of that, like go into this folder data and get this file, this wildlife impact CSV, I can create each of those steps with just 
as separate arguments. So go to the folder called data and then go to this thing called wildlife impacts. impacts.csv. So all this thing does is say, okay, now I'm gonna create that path. Here's the path, it goes all the way to my root directory. This is my root directory. Here's a bunch of folders where all my stuff lives. And that's my root, that's where my working directory is. And then it's gonna go to this data folder and it's gonna go to this CSV file. The reason I do this is because then I can send this code to you on your computer and it'll work because it's gonna generate the path from the root of whatever your computer is to that file. And it'll also work across different systems, right? So if I run this here function on Windows, it's gonna put the backslash in the opposite direction because that's the way the backslashes go. Versus if I just hard coded this, you know, if I said, read my CSV using this, this is only going to work on my machine. It will never work on another computer. And in fact, if I take this folder and move it somewhere else, then it's gonna break. So I, I never hard code file pass. I always dynamically generate file pass. That's what here is doing. Once you've got your file path, you read it in with this simple thing called read CSV. It's very straightforward. And so read CSV is part of this read R library. Readr has a bunch of other functions for reading in all kinds of data. You can read things from Excel. You can read things from, I, I, don't, I don't know if it does JSON, but it does a bunch of different um, uh, things for reading in files. But it's mostly, I think read CSV is like the most common thing. Um, you'll, you'll very regularly see CSV files um, that you want to read into R. And again, there is a base version of this. Uh, Read.csv is the base R version. So let's see. Um, Here's my example of create my path to my data. So there it is, and then read it in. So here's my data frame of a bunch of stuff about birds hitting planes. Um, so or you can look at it this way too. Here's the data. Um, so I've read it in. Now you could do this other thing called read.csv, um, but it requires a lot more effort. When I do read.csv, I have to say, is there a header? So I have to say, yes, header equals true. Um, because the first row is the column names. And then I also have to tell it how I want you to handle these variables that are characters, right? So these are all, it says CHR, that's for characters. So I see a bunch of stuff like the state, like which state are you in, which the airport ID, what's the airport name. All of those things are read in as characters. If I use read.csv, it reads them in as a factor, which I usually don't want to do. So I have to say strings as factors equals false. So like all this extra arguments that again, if you're a novice and you've never read in external data, you're probably gonna be wondering, what is all that about? And if I didn't do that, I'm gonna get some weird stuff, like things that are not gonna look right. Um, it's not gonna, not necessarily gonna work. And in this case, it's a very clean data set. So it knew to, to put a header in, but a lot of times it won't. Um, so I avoid all that. I just say, you know what? You don't have to do this. If you just use read CSV with the underscore, which is coming from the read our library, it's a much more robust, um, you know, uh, way of reading in data. Likewise for, for exporting data, it's the same idea, write CSV, that's it. So all of these little packages, you know, really nicely fit together. I haven't even covered ggplot yet, um, teaching that this coming week, but there's some of the ideas. Now ggplot is, is kind of a demarcation point from this piping idea. Um, ggplot is really its, its own thing for creating plots, but it, I think the closer, the more important thing of why it's part of this tidyverse is that um, the way we structure our data, the way we set it up um, for our columns being the categories of different variables and rows being a single observation if you structured your data set this way, then that works very nicely with ggplot because ggplot will then say, I'm going to take these variables and plot them as like a scatter plot or a bar plot. If you've organized your data in a different way, it won't, it won't work so, so smoothly. Um, but, but the idea behind ggplot is, is, you know, taking columns off of these variables and plotting them into a different ge geometries like bars and plot and points. And, um, and so again, there's more syntax to learn for how to do that, but, but it plays very nicely. So let me, let me see if I can't just make a quick example in, on the fly here with, uh, so let's say here, I've done some, some extra work here on this flights data. This is again, birds hitting planes, right? So I created a summary data frame here. I, I, I counted how many accidents there were by year 
and then I've sorted it based on the descending number here. Um, so let's sort it based on year. So I keep this in order. Whoops, not what I want. Incident year. So here you go. Here's my, my data frame of uh, how many birds hit aircrafts in this data set uh, by year. And you can see this goes back quite a way, 19 more rows. So it goes back to the early 90s. If I wanted to create a plot, I could just go straight from that and pipe it right into a plot. So here's my another pipe. And I can say ggplot. And so ggplot, instead of using the pipe operator, it uses plus signs because you're adding layers. So you, you're, you can sort of think like similarly like piping, but the plus sign was used and built far be, before um, the bigger tidyverse was developed. So ggplot was one of the earliest libraries. And so as, as a result, we have two different sort of syntaxes for piping, piping things that are dealing with your data frame and then adding layers in a, in a plot. But I'm not gonna talk about this code um, in detail, but let's just say I'm gonna make a scatter point, a scatter plot. I'm not gonna explain how I'm doing this, but basically I'm gonna map these variables. So I'm gonna put incident year on the X axis and my Y axis is gonna be the count. And so I started with that raw data frame this set of code is creating this summary data frame and then I'm piping right into a plot. So two more lines of code and I go from this table to this plot. So, so you can see the really nice like streamline of I've, in fact, I could go even, I could go to the raw source if I really wanted to, I could, I could say this, <laughs> I type fast, but basically, Here's the path to the data file. Let's read it in directly. So here's the raw data. I've read it in. Now let's count how many incidences by year, sort that. I actually don't even need this. It's not even necessary. Then go into a plot and make a scatter plot of X and Y variables. So from the, from the raw data to the plot is four, four lines of code. Not, yeah, I don't even need this one. So only four lines of code. Reading the data to the plot. There's your plot. And obviously you can see there is a trend here, right? We're hitting a lot more birds every year. Why? Probably because there's more flights in the air every year. Like there's more and more planes flying and probably because we're getting better at reporting them. I th I, there's probably a two, two different effects of, these are self-reported data sets. So, um, so anyway, there, there you go. There's, um, that's ggplot and how it fits in. So this is a very you know, common workflow. If I go back to this, uh, you know, this image I showed you earlier about, you know, wrangling and how this all fits together. The tidyverse sort of fits in at different points along this map. You know, I've used Redar to, here's in this, in this simple example, you can see the different libraries. This is Redar, which is importing my data. Here's doing some, some dplyr stuff to count my observations by year. So that's this little bit. And here's some visualization code. So this is ggplot doing this part. And all of those libraries, you know, work really nicely together to create this, this image. And of course, you could do all of these things without any of these functions. You could do all of this in base R, and there's nothing really wrong with doing that. Um, every single piece of uh, uh, operation that's going in that four line block is doable with base R. Um, but I, I find it harder and harder to remember all of the different like ways that 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 all goes together. Whereas here, the fact that I can just very quickly and streamlined in just four lines of code go from raw data in my computer to plot in a, in a pretty, pretty decent looking plot. I mean, there's a lot we can do to make that look better, but that's not bad. Um, so, so that's kind of like the purpose of tidyverse. And this is when a lot of people nowadays are learning R, they're learning this first in, instead of base R stuff. And it's almost like its own language now. Um, but it's kind of just like if you're doing any data analysis work in Python, very few people are going to be doing it in just pure Python. Almost everybody's going to be doing this based, you know, using pandas and numpy and matplotlib and all of these external libraries that really do the heavy lifting to make data science in Python actually doable. R is kind of in a similar world where you can do it all in base R, but it's not very easy to do. You have to I think you have to work a lot harder and be a lot more experienced and, 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 and probably have to um, have been coding a lot longer to, to get the nuances of what's going on. Whereas here, I, I think these are much more 
intuitive. So, so that's kind of a quick overview of the tidyverse. And there's, like I said, there's so many other things that we could talk about. Um, but that's kind of what my whole course is. I have a fall and a spring year where I cover most of these core tidyverse packages and we use them in different ways. Um, so I guess, what all do you load? So if I came to you and I said, let's do some data analysis on this data that I'm importing, like what is your initial typical load pattern? What are all your most common packages? These two. Do you right do here. tidyverse in here? Yeah. But do you do because others? Like if you're going to look at data for your research, are there others that you would say are on like your top five list of things you load almost every time? So these two are always there. Um, I can't really do a lot without them nowadays. <laughs> I, I, I would spend three or four times as much time if I didn't have these two. So, so this, this is really the, you know, the mega package loading five or six yep. other packages with it. The other one that I commonly load is janitor and it's only because of a single function that I use. Um, and that's called the clean names function. Uh, so janitor is a nice little package um, that, that does a bunch of stuff. Um, oh, this, yeah, it, it has all these other features in it for, for cleaning up data. That's why it's called janitor. But um, I think where, where it comes in really handy, I've got this data frame, let's say on, uh, now this one's already really nicely formatted, so this isn't really gonna demonstrate it well, but um, all, all I do with clean names is it cleans up my, my, my column names. It makes it a lot easier to read. Let's see if I can't find a, a messy example. Um, um, I've got a bunch of different messy data floating around if I can find something here. Or you know what, I think I got one I worked with the other day some research thing I was doing on cars. I don't know. I tend to clean up my data really nicely. So uh, chances are this is already pretty clean. Yeah, these are already clean. <laughs> but let no me- No problem, I was just curious. I mean, well, let me show it because I mean, this in is the a, Python world, we have kind of our own, like you're always loading pandas, you're always loading Plotlab. Um, so I was let wondering me just, what kind of are the go-to. Let me just show you an example. Something really horrible. Let's say some, oh, some horrible person gave you some data file that looked like this. And I don't know why you would do this, but all the, all the names are wrong, right? And so I called this, uh, this was some sales data. So it's salesdata.csv. So if I read this thing in, Here's my names and they're just horrible. I mean, like I, if I, I've got capital letters, I've got like, and, and it can get a lot worse. You can have a dot in there. You can have all kinds of weird things. And so what, what janitor does is I often just pipe it right after reading it. And I say, um, clean names, that's it. Now my data frame looks like this. Um, so it did, a, it made a few assumptions, right? It like it said, oh, this is weird. I'm gonna put an underscore here. I'm not really sure why these things are capitalized. I'm gonna put some underscores there. And you know, you can, you can fix them. And there's a bunch of different options inside here of how to fix it. But, but this is very common. You'll get really messy data and like clean up those yeah. column names so that everything you're doing with it, like filtering and selecting later, you're using a very nice cleaned up names. Um, I think those are my top three. I, I use this very, very commonly um, to, to bring external data into R and start working with it. Um, so these two are really just right after I read it in. Everything else is really coming from here. And, and then, you know, probably my other one that I would, I would do, which is just for if I'm visualizing thing, which I do a lot of is Calplot. <laughs> Calplot um, is, uh, just a, a, um, a library by Klaus O. Wilk, so C-O-W, that's why it's cow, not the animal. Um, he's just done a lot of work to create some really nice clean themes for cleaning up your, your, your plots. I, I think they, and, and, and lots of little features like, you know, putting two plots next to each other and um, 
putting them on a, on a different grid, changing the colors and stuff. Again, a lot of this you can do in, in ggplot directly, but he's, he's done a lot of work to make some nice, you know, nice clean themes. Um, and I use these very, very, uh, all, all the time um, to talk about like just, it just does a lot of the work for you. One or two lines of code and you've, and you've cleaned up your whole yeah. chart. Cool. So let's, let's see that example before I go away with this. Like there's my plot, right? And now that I've got yeah. my calplot library, let's just go theme um, calplot. <laughs> Looks very different. Uh, it just yeah. simplifies it, gets it condensed down. You don't need all these grid lines. It just, here's the trend. There's an upward trend. That's the plot. You're very close to a publishable plot already with that one line. So I, I find he's got a lot of different themes, but I find his, his stuff, you know, very useful. So there you go. Those are my four. And that's a very different workflow from, you know, the typical sort of scikit library. And uh, none of this is any modeling stuff, right? This is all exploratory yeah. work. When you get into modeling, that's when I'm going to be doing a whole different set of libraries that I'm going to pull in. Um, and, and again, you can do a ton of modeling from the tidyverse. There is a whole other um, concept now called tidy models, <laughs> uh, where you've it's it it plugs right in. It's like very plug and play with the tidyverse. So if you're used to doing this piping stuff, you can pipe right into um, to some modeling work. And uh, this is again an, an kind of its own little world, but it, it does it, it follows like says you know it follows the tidyverse principles. It follows the similar way of uh, of thinking, and so you, you can do all sorts of things about you know sampling and you know just just a lot of stuff here. But the documentation on all of these is is just absolutely excellent. That's another reason it's so popular is that it's so easy to learn. You you can go here and just read these like K means clustering and here you go. I mean, you very, very nicely written out examples and you can see that uh, Alison Horst is uh, here as well yeah. uh, with her little monsters, you know, it just, I, I find all of the, the, the sort of the attention to detail on how things are taught and presented in the people who are tidyverse enthusiasts is very, very high, uh, very high levels of, of documentation, the, really the best I've seen in, in most of the sort of data science world. So it, it's very popular because it, it's easier to learn when things are clean and, and, and really nice, simple examples. So, so there's the, the tidyverse gets much larger. And once you get into modeling, you could stay in this world and, and go right into, uh, you know, move right into modeling. So, so that's, that's everything that's, uh, mostly everything I would say for getting started. If anything, that's just like an inspirational, you know, get, get yeah. involved. <laughs> so, so go learn tidyverse. Uh, and if you want to take my courses, that's what I teach. A lot of, a lot of stuff is the, I teach the tidy things. Um, well, I found it helpful. So, yeah. So, and now it's recorded. All right, I guess you it's recorded. recording. It's recorded, so I will post this. I will stop now.